IPM is about connecting us to our mission. It's about celebrating what we've achieved, understanding our mission, where we're going, and connecting each of us to it. I am really thrilled to be leading this institution at that time, at this time. And as I go around looking at the, the, the profiles, I feel very proud of the great people, scientists, and individuals that we have. Um, My task today is the simple one of making a few statements about the state of Hillary. I want to say it moved for Mahaki, but it's not moving for me. <laughs> Where do I point to? Okay. Yes, it's moving now. I would like to talk about the state of Hillary using these three indicators. I want to talk about the strength of Hillary, its impact, and how it's making progress and being resilient. First, I want to say that Hillary is strong. And the people who helped me with this presentation put a bull, a strength. I mean, no if, uh, offense to the heifers. <laughs> but Hillary is strong. And what are some of these indicators of our strength? It's because of its people. All of us in this tent and those who are left behind. This morning, we recognize that a good part of Hillary, more than 100 people, were not here at the last IPM two and a half years ago. Our staff is growing, and we are adding more and more wonderful people to contribute to our mission. So Hillary is not our buildings, although I'll say that we're proud of those, we're proud of our facilities, the most important asset is our staff. I know it's a bit of a cliche to say that, but at Hillary, it's, I hope you agree with me that it's really true. So it's strong because of all of you. It's strong because it's growing. In 2011, we were $44 million annual budget, and now we are $87 million as an annual budget. We have much more resources to do much more in more places of the world. Robert told me yesterday in a meeting that our reserves are $22 million. So we have not only operating budget, but we have some reserves to cushion us in hard times. Since 2011, we've spent $23 million on infrastructure, new infrastructure, improving our infrastructure, and generally giving us more capabilities to do what we would like to do. It's a little glaring, so it's hard to even see my own slides from this vantage point. But um, here are some pictures of some of the infrastructure we have put in place. On the far left of this screen, it might be, yes, the far left of both screens, it would be the new Saluta building, which is the new gene bank and research building we built here. Those of you who go to our research farm in Machakos, we have new facilities there to do research. We have 
improved our facilities, not only in the offices, but new workstations, greening the, the, the campus a bit by um, putting solar panels, and so on and so forth. My point is that we're strong because we have good people, good facilities, and we have a compelling mission. A few slides about Ilri making impacts. We're about using livestock to change livelihoods, or as we say, better lives through livestock. Here are some of the impact stories that I would like to talk about. And these are only a few examples. In this picture, you will see that the group working on food safety has, I would say, convinced the world over time that food safety in the developing countries is a very important issue. It has risen recently to the top of the agenda. And in this picture, you will see me participating with the likes of FAO, OIE, WHO on a big food safety conference here with the African Union to put this higher up on the, uh, the agenda. You will see a picture there of the impacts of the guys working on breeding and genetics in Tanzania just recently. Um, through genomic selection, farmers are able to select their elite male and female animals. This we are doing not only in Tanzania, but in Ethiopia and Kenya, and we're expanding this work elsewhere pretty soon. We just had the All-African Conference in, in Ghana, where the livestock community came together with our support and a good bit of leadership from Ilri to try to put livestock higher up on the agenda. Incidentally, Marky, my story there was not just about the economics and so on of livestock, but I said to the audience that I'm sure many of you would not have been married if there were no livestock. There are a number of impact stories that I can talk about, and I uh, don't want to delve in great detail because many of you know it, but I want to give you some additional flavors. That we, I talked about food safety. I talked about, the, I want to tell you about the work that is happening in forages. As you know, most forages that are used around the world came from Africa. They were used in Latin America to develop the livestock sector. Forages were hardly grown in Africa, except for cotton curry system, elephant grass, and so on. Now that farmers are connected to market and are looking to improve their livestock systems, forages are being grown as crops. And so the work we're doing with Precaria in several countries are engaging farmers and creating opportunities to improve their productivity. The work that is happening about developing databases that are used, as Khalid has just said, to target what are the problems and the solutions to the various places we are trying to work is bearing fruit. This is not only with databases about livestock and their breeding and their characteristics, but it's the circumstances of the farmers and how to target their particular problems. Um, as you would know, there is a strong headwind about livestock and the environment, livestock and obesity, and so on. And through your work, we are able to communicate some of the issues more clearly in a more nuanced way. 
those who argue about reducing consumption. Many other countries where consumption is very high, North America and Europe, we are able to communicate that it's a more nuanced situation in the developing countries. Consumption is much lower, and therefore livestock in the diets of people is more important than people understand. We're able to communicate the issues about livestock and climate change and to bring real data to bring knowledge to these debates. So just today, Shirley gave me a new input to this of an article in the Financial Times. And here on this poster are some of the some of the things that are, we have published over time in very important newspapers and popular press as well. We will have an award ceremony later this week, but here are some of the people who have been receiving awards in Hillary. Professor Tadeli, where is he? Professor Tadeli has just received an award as is Professor Tom Randall, where is he? One from Ethiopian University and another from uh, Swedish, Uppsala. Tom, are you in the room? Um, recently, we received an award in Uganda for the work we're doing there on One Health and on food safety. And the work that was done recently to try to bring a, a day of pastoralism, we're trying to get the UN to declare a day of pastoralism in a year or two, that has been forged by many of you at the last UNEP meeting. I am experiencing a problem I didn't expect to experience is that I can't see the screen from this angle in the glare. So forgive me for my incoherence of, uh, relating to my very pictures that I put there. But these are some of the achievements that we'll talk about later. All of this is about improving livelihoods of people. Starting with the end in mind, I think Khalid told us that we have to start with the end in mind, not what we think is necessary, but what is really necessary in the field, and to change our approach over time. So Hillary is being impactful. Hillary is being progressive and resilient. And I want to talk about three areas in which Hillary is changing. The first is the tremendous opportunity there is for growth and transformation in the livestock sector all over the world. As you know, it's not a foregone conclusion that the world would feed itself by time population stabilizes, sometime at around 10 billion or so. And so the challenge of producing 60% more food on the same land base that we have, that some say is reaching its ecological limits, is a tremendous challenge. Our contributions to food and nutritional, not just food, but nutritional security, will be very important. But in meeting these food and nutritional needs, the opportunity to use livestock to transform people's lives through, as Khalid said, making them not beneficiaries, but parts of the private sector, is a tremendous opportunity. So our work will, needs to be responsive to the tremendous opportunities for using livestock in food and nutritional security, in dealing with poverty, and of course, transforming lives in the rural space in particular. But there are some challenges that we know about. We must have our work contribute to livestock in three sustainable contexts, socially, economically, and environmentally. And it's the environmental one that probably poses the most challenge. As I've said many times, many of our donors have said to me, why should we be funding livestock 
if it's so d disastrous for the environment and overconsumption is such a challenge. Well, as I said earlier, our work that use evidence to present more nuanced debates about the livestock sector in the di different parts of the developing world is very important. More importantly, we must get real data about what is the impact of livestock in the developing countries so that we do not use extrapolations from elsewhere where the livestock sector is quite different, such as North American Europe, to set the the regulatory and other standards. We have the challenge of obesity, those who eat too much, to which I say often that those who make, those who are obese because of poor choice of food should not be compared with those who have no choice of food. So there is no um, equivalence between those who eat too much and those who eat too little. We have to be able to present that argument in compelling ways. Um, and so it's all of us who have to tackle these issues in ways that will convince the policymakers, our investors, and farmers themselves that they're engaged in good, sustainable livelihoods. So ALU will continue to grow its workforce over the next several years. We're just under 700 strong now. And we hope that over the next five years, as we commit to the new agenda we're fostering, everything is falling apart around me, Bonnie. <laughs> We expect to grow the Hillary budget from, from the 87 where we are now to 150 million in five years' time. Now remember when we were 44 million and we said we'd grow it to 100, many people said, no, it's not possible. But we have largely done so. So the ambition to reach 150 million in the next five years is not beyond our reach. And if we continue to make the waves you have been making over the last five years, this is e easily doable. So, Hillary is strong. It's growing, it's impactful, and it's changing. And as Khalid said, we must adapt to change. Change is in our DNA. And so far, we've done a good job. So as the leader of Hillary at this time, I feel very proud. I feel very inspired to see so many of our staff from around the world assembled here. It is a tremendous opportunity to celebrate our achievements, to revisit and reaffirm our mission, and to discern our own place in contributing to that mission. Thank you very much.